I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about cross-browser HTML5 video, the web as a gaming platform, jQuery 2.0, and more. Let's check it out. First up, over on the Cats Who Code blog, which is basically the internet and coding combined, there is a blog post on cross-browser HTML5 video and how you implement it. Now, it's actually not as hard as you might expect to implement cross-browser HTML5 video. So let's take a little look at how we do it. Step one is prepare the files. This makes a lot of sense. If you're going to be surfing videos, well, you need to have them in formats that all the different browsers can read. So there is an online conversion site that you can use. You upload your video, and then you can download it in the different formats required. Next up, it's actually really easy to use. Um, to create a video tag. That's all it is. Just use a video tag and then list the different sources that the converted files come in. So you upload them to the site, give it the different path, and you're ready to go. Finally, you need to tell your web server how to process those different files. So uh, you add the different types using the HT access file in Apache, and Nginx will have slightly different syntax. Um, finally, you can use an object tag to create a fallback for older browsers, and that is it. That is all you have to do to serve HTML5 video. Nick, could that be any easier? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I, unless you could just push a button and it happens automatically. I didn't think about that, but that's a very good point. Slightly easier. Yeah. Next up is this amazing post over on the Mozilla blog. And I'm going to preface this by saying this is very advanced, and even I barely understand it. But we're going to take a look at it anyway. Uh, basically, Mozilla is, has teamed up with Epic Games, and they have ported the Unreal Engine 3 to the web using this highly optimized version of JavaScript that's, uh, that's inside of their web browser. So they um, you know, just did something that's completely amazing here. It uses JavaScript, HTML, and WebGL. And if you go ahead and watch the videos, it, I mean, it just has absolutely amazing frame rates uh, right in the browser. And I'm just completely shocked that this is even possible that we're like at this point where we can start considering developing games and high performance 3D games like that inside of the browser. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. The, uh, the project they use is called ASM.js, which is a smaller subset of JavaScript, and that's what lets them optimize it so much. That's uh, integrated into newer versions of Firefox Nightlies. Look at that. This guy adding some clarity. Pretty amazing stuff. Yep. Very, very, very cool. And I think um, you know, this is kind of like the next, next horizon, in my opinion. But I, I think we're going to start seeing some really amazing games developed inside of the browser. So I hope so. I don't know what that's going to mean for web developers or for the gaming industry, but it's certainly exciting. It means you have to know how to code games on the web. That's right. Uh, next up, uh, big news, jQuery 2.0 has been released. Um, big news because pretty much everybody uses jQuery these days. And this is version 2.0. I mean, yeah. jQuery has been around for quite some time, so having a 2.0 release Monumental. Is Pretty crazy. Yeah. So one of the big things uh, about jQuery 2.0 is that it drops support for older browsers, i.e. 6, 7, and 8 will not work with jQuery 2.0. If you do need to use i.e. 6, 7, and 8, you can still use jQuery 1.9. They say not to worry because they're going to be supporting it. Now, the big benefit that you're going to get with jQuery 2.0 is that since those older browsers don't need to be supported, all the code that dealt with the workarounds for them has been able to be dropped from jQuery. Now, some of that code was causing problems on its own. So what you get is just speedier sites on newer browsers. And by newer, we mean IE9 and up. And almost any version of Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whatever, will be supported in jQuery 2.0. Anyway, go ahead and download that. Use it on your site. Install it. Good to go. We'll link to a changelog in the show notes that you can get to at youtube.com slash gotreehouse or in our iTunes feed. I'm pretty shocked that they're actually dropping support for uh, IE 6, 7, and 8. I guess I'm less shocked about 6 and 7, but 
eight is uh, you know still pretty widely used. So it, it, it's interesting because jQuery is used just almost everywhere on the web, and so they have a lot of sway in terms of what browsers should be used by uh, used by people. So yeah, well they do, and that's why they give you the option of staying on one point nine if you do need to support those older browsers, which unfortunately uh, some of us still do. That's right. So pretty. Pretty amazing. Uh, now, when I say support, I mean be able to use it on your site, not like console it during times of need. Mm, like, like I do for you. Yeah. Occasionally. Next up, related is uh, not related to me consoling Jason. Related to jQuery. Thank you for that. Is 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 is, is jQuery jQuery Builder. Uh, jQuery Builder lets you easily build a custom version of jQuery, and so just like we were discussing. You can go ahead and select version 2.0, which includes a lot more modules, or you can go ahead and drop it back down to 1.9 if you do need to go ahead and support Internet Explorer 8. And then you, then you just uh, check off the modules that you want to go ahead and include, and it will give you a button where you can go ahead and build that and download it. Or you can do it from the command line and get it from GitHub. And they even offer a node.js command line interface tool. So you can go ahead and install it that way. So pretty cool stuff. I mean, it's, there's not a whole lot to say about it, but it's, it's you know, a nifty way to go ahead and just build a custom version of jQuery that could go ahead and save you a little bit of uh, file space. Uh, hot on the heels of that is a blog post about shame.css, very appropriate. This is a blog <laughs> post by Harry Roberts who talks about design patterns when working with CSS. Now, if you do need to support older browsers, at some point you'll have to use some hacks in your CSS to get things to display correctly. Now, you want to try to avoid hacks, of course, in your CSS. Yeah. But in, Things happen. Yeah, I mean, in practical use cases, yeah, there, there are situations where you do have hacks that you have to use. Right, you know, maybe you don't have time to optimize something and you got to get the site out yesterday. Anyway, um, what Harry is saying is put this all in a file called shame.css and then comment about why you're using these hacks. And then later, when you have time to refactor, you can go through and change up your CSS file, take it out of shame.css or whatever. Now, what he's saying to do, what's a really important part of this, is you don't want this file like just as a file out on your web server called shame.css. You should be using a CSS preprocessor to concatenate and minify your CSS files. So put it in there and then let the preprocessor deal with it. And if you're not using a preprocessor, uh, maybe use some sort of build script beforehand to get that all going. Or you could just rename it, you know. That's a good point. Yep. These are not hacks.css. That's right. Next up is this amazing tool called UI Faces, and it's basically like lorem ipsum text, but for avatars. Nice. So let's say that you're building a new interface and you need to go ahead and put some profile pictures in there. And you know, this is just a quick way to get some, some photos that are representative of what normal people use as profile pictures. Like that Batman avatar. That's right. And you can go ahead and drop them into your prototype. You can, of course, adjust the size of these avatars just with this little slider right here. You can adjust the spacing between them, and you can even adjust the border radii. And let's see, will it go? Yeah, look at that. You can even adjust the border radii to the point where the avatars are just a circle. So that's pretty cool there. Um, again, similar to uh, jQuery Builder, I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about this, but uh, it's still really nifty if you're prototyping an app and you just want to get some avatars in there and you just you know, want to go for it. So pretty cool. Really nice. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have a link to an online book called Single Page Apps in Depth. If you're using a single page application framework like Backbone, Spine.js, or many of the others that we've talked about here on the Treehouse Show before, uh, you could go back and watch every other episode for more information on that. Uh, anyway, so this book walks through 
everything that you're going to need to know when coding a single page application. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to go through everything on here, but it goes through everything from writing maintainable code, looking at the implementation, uh, how to use different views and templating, you know, binding the data from HTML to the DOM and the models on the back end. So there's just a ton of different nuances to building single page applications and this book does a really good job of going through them. Uh, you can find a link to that in the show notes uh, in our iTunes feed at uh, The Treehouse Show or in our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse. Next up is this really cool post from CodeDrops uh, where they've built these responsive multi-level menus. Ooh. That, that is quite the tongue twister. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the demo here. I'm going to go ahead and click on this very common three-line menu design pattern. We've talked about that on the show before. So go ahead and click on that. And it brings up, you know, this pretty normal looking menu as you'd expect. However, when I click into this menu, whoa, look at that. Whoa, are we in the future? It's looking that way, Jason. Basically, you click on this and it will slide the next uh, level of the menu over. They have a couple of different demos here, so let's go ahead and see what this one does. Very cool stuff. Basically, each demo is just a different style of, of animation. Um, but uh, it's a nice way to do menus because a lot of times when you have multi-level menus like this, you're sort of moving your mouse and like you want to like make sure that the menu doesn't go away so you go to the next right. one and you have to like make sure that you're hovered over in the right area and that you don't lose the menu and when you're like two or three menus deep not only do you have to make sure you have your cursor in the right place you also have to make sure that you know it's not taking up like so much of the screen that it's ridiculous like it's just there's a lot of problems with doing it basically and so this is a nice way to just consolidate all of that into a compact space where the user can keep their mouse in one spot. Very nice. Very cool stuff. So I think that's about all we have for this episode. Nick, who are you on Twitter? I am at NickRP. And I am at JCypher. If you want more background on anything that we talked about, check us out in iTunes. Search for The Treehouse Show. You can also find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash go treehouse. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one where we talk about web design, web development, iOS, Android, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.